What is up, my dudes, and welcome to Chapter 2 in CCNA Phase 1. Now, I, I didn't realize it, but I named my YouTube channel Junior Bacon. Junior Bacon is typically the name I use when I um, uh, play online games. Um, but I'm going to have to change that to just Mac Does Tech all the way across the board. So, this chapter is kind of weird. It used to be the very last chapter in the book of the Phase 1, which made sense. because now, And now it's the second chapter... And then after this, we're not going to touch routers and switches anymore until phase to the next course. So I don't know why they jam it here. It just makes more sense to have it as the last chapter so that that content is fresh in your head when you get to phase two. But I'll just make another video in phase two, like a starter video that kind of covers some of this stuff. All right. So here's the objectives. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Remember, if you want to read those, just hit pause. All right. iOS boot camp. So Cisco's operating system is called the iOS, and it's actually registered to Cisco. Um, Apple uses it under a license. Now the iOS consists of the shell and the kernel. The shell is either the command line interface or the graphical user interface that enables the user to interface with you know with the stuff. And then the kernel is what actually uh, works directly with the, the hardware and manages hardware resources. And then obviously hardware is the stuff on the router, you know, memory, that kind of stuff. All right, so the purpose of the operating system is either to provide a GUI, which is a graphical user interface, um, to allow you to do stuff, or to provide a CLI, which is a command line interface, um, which is what the CCNA is all about. It's all CLI. Uh, Cisco has a GUI. It's called Cisco Configuration Professional. And as far like, I've never seen anybody use that like out there in the real world because all Cisco training is command line. So that's all anybody knows is command line stuff. So it's kind of weird. So there's different versions of the iOS for each series of switch or, or router. And um, so the model numbers might be like the 1900, the 2600, the 3700, <coughs> excuse me. And then for each um, series, like the, the, the 1900, there might be a 1901, there might be a 1921. So several different routers at that level. Uh, there's typically one iOS that covers all those in that series, the 1900s. And then each um, version um, of the iOS um, has like um, a, a content package. Now, by default, you get the base or LAN base. So it'll be, it'll have like a, if, I don't know if you can see this over here, but this is C2960, uh, 2960, so this is for a switch. This is the LAN base, so it's the base model. But there's also, so there's LAN base, there's voice, there's security, there's enterprise. So there's a whole lot of different ones. So when you buy the router or switch, or whatever you're looking for, um, you, you can either get the correct version then, or you can buy the base version and then just upgrade later on. Um, basically, you just create the Cisco account, the Cisco Connection Online account, um, and then you can pay money and get whatever version that you need. All right, so we access a router or a switch um, in several different ways. So there's the out-of-band management, which is the console port or the auxiliary port. Now I'm going to bring up Packet Tracer. Packet Tracer is a neat little tool that they get you if you go to an official Cisco Academy. And if I grab a router, like I'm just going to grab this 1941, pop it here on the screen. And if I click on it, and let's zoom in on that a little bit bigger. Let me... And zoom in. So this one, like you can see, there's a console port, and then there's an auxiliary port. The auxiliary port was originally used for modems, and a lot of people still use that. Um, and you're like, well, who uses modems nowadays? Well, when the internet goes out, how are you going to have somebody dial in it and make changes to your router Like if you have issues? So that's why we still use aux ports, and we still use modems, although typically we have the modem turned off unless we need it, because we don't want somebody dialing in and getting access to our router. So the console port is a physical port that we plug into. But the auxiliary port works the exact same way. So you can actually plug your console cable into the auxiliary port. So these two ports do the exact same thing. One is called the console port and one is the auxiliary port. Nowadays, Cisco ships with a, a mini uh, USB cable um, and that's what they want you to use. Um, but they, they still have the old console ports. So it all depends on, I guess, what, what model you get. Um, whether you get a console cable or a mini uh, USB. I know I just bought some 29 or 5506 firewalls and they did not come with a console cable, they came with the mini USB. 
All right, and then there's other ports to, to connect things to, and then you've got uh, these slots, and these slots are for WAN interface cards. So usually these two ports here um, are either gigabit or they're fast ethernet, fast ethernet being 100 megabits per second, gigabit being 1,000 megabits per second. And these are just NIC cards. And they, these typically connect to your local network, like at your business, and then this WAN, you put a card in here and just slide in the slot, and that's what you would connect to other networks. So let's say you have a huge headquarters network and then you buy an office five miles down the road um, for something else. And then you buy a T1 through a service provider and then you put a card in there that accepts that T1 handoff, whatever it is, whether it's copper, fiber, or um, radio, or microwave, something like that, who knows. Uh, and obviously, most of the time, it's either a fiber or a, a copper handoff. So it's either RJ45 or, or a fiber N. And you slap the card in, plug in the cable, and you're all set. So these slots here are numbered 0 and then 1. So Cisco always numbers their interfaces starting at 0. So local connections, yellow. Uh, slots are for other cards. So like I can turn this router off, and then I can grab a, a WIC 2T, pop it in there, and you see like, so whatever your handoff is, that's the port you'll get on your card. Turn it back on, and I'm all set. All right, so moving on. Now, there's in-band uh, management as well. In-band means it typically requires an IP address. And Secure Shell and Telnet are really the same thing. Um, basically, you're going, to, you're going to open up some kind of um, uh, terminal emulator program, and we typically use PuTTY. And then you're going to dial in based on the IP address. Now, and I say that they're the same, but Secure Shell, SSH, encrypts the traffic. Telnet does not. So Telnet sends everything in plain text, where SSH um, obviously wraps everything up in encryption uh, so that people can't kind of spy on your, your content. All right, so the, the big terminal emulators, that I've, never, I've never even seen it. I think TerraTerm used to be popular a long time ago. Nowadays, everybody just downloads PuTTY. It's a very small executable file. There's also secure CRT, um, but PuTTY kind of does everything that you need. Uh, when we get to phase two, um, I'll cover PuTTY in depth uh, and show you some of the settings and how things work. All right, so iOS modes. So the Cisco iOS um, uses a hierarchical command structure. So it means there's different modes. In a different mode, you can do different things. The farther in you go, typically the more control you have on the router. So when you first start out, it starts out in user mode. And, and they always call it user exec mode, privilege exec mode. Um, don't worry about that. Just, so user mode is what we start out with. In user mode, the prompt looks like it just says router and then a greater than sign. So when you look at the prompt, it tells you what mode you're in because it's a greater than sign. You will see that on the CCNA. They'll show you one of these prompts and they'll say, what mode is the router in? Or can I run this command you know, currently at the router um, based on the mode it's in? So user mode is kind of a view only mode. There's not a whole lot of commands you can do uh, in user mode. So from user mode, you need to go up to the next level, which is privilege mode or priv mode. Um, priv is also sometimes called enable mode um, because you, you from user mode you type in the word enable and then that takes you into privilege mode. In privilege mode, the prompt looks like the hashtag or for us older people, the pound sign. All right, and then, then the, the third mode is actually global mode. From global mode, we can actually make configuration changes. So user mode, I can kind of view a few, a few minor things. In privilege mode, I can, kind of, I can do all my viewing. I can gather all my information. I can also manipulate the iOS files and the configuration files. But global mode is where I actually set things. I can set the name of the router. I can set IP addresses, things like that. So in global mode, the prompt looks a little bit different. Let me show you what that is. I want to bring this up. What? Where the heck is that at? Okay. So click on the router. Go to CLI. So hit return. Um, so obviously I start out in user mode. You can see the prompt is a greater than sign. I type in enable, and now I'm in privilege mode. And then I can do config T. And now I'm in global mode. So when the prompt says router config, you're in global mode. And I need to fix that so you guys can start seeing that stuff. So in Packet Tracer, you can go to Font, CLI, let's go to 18, and apply. And then close that. And now, so now you can kind of see it much better. So there's the prompt for config mode, and you can either type in config t or con, con f t. I typically just do con f t because obviously I want to type as, as little as possible. You can type en for enable, so you get the idea. 
All right, let's close all that out. Uh, okay. All right, your router has interfaces and lines. A line is typically used to make changes in the router, to do programming to the router itself, um, to change that. And then an interface is used to send user data. So the interfaces will pass user data, you know, between interfaces, between networks, where the lines are used um, just for us to configure the router. So you have three main lines, and it's the console port, so line console zero, the auxiliary port, which is line aux zero, and then the telnet lines. And the telnet lines, five people can be telnetted in the, at the same time to a router. So you need to configure all the lines. So we do line space VTY space zero space five or four. Duh. So there, and because there's five lines, we have to do zero through four because everything starts at zero with Cisco. And again, eventually we'll talk about that more and we'll actually do it. All right. So to navigate between modes, remember I type in enable and that takes me from user to privilege mode. And I've got some notes here. So if you, uh, hold on a sec. Okay. So if you support me on Patreon, you can have access to these notes. Um, so when we talk about out of band, we're talking about um, things that I can connect to without an IP address, console port or auxiliary port. When we're talking about in band, we're talking about secure shell or telnet. Here's the three different prompts that you'll see in the three different modes. Now, from global mode, there's also other sub-interface modes and stuff like that, and we'll talk about that later. But to go from user mode to privilege, enable. To go from privilege back down to user mode is disable. To go from privilege to global, config T. To go from global to privilege, just type in exit. <coughs> Excuse me. There's also context-sensitive help we'll talk about next. And so here we go. So we can do line console 0 or line aux 0 or line VTY space 0 space 4. So let's talk about that. Ooh, let's not talk about that. So from global mode, I can type in exit and I can go back one level. And then if I type in end, no matter how far I'm into the router, like if I go to sub interface mode, um, I, I went to global mode and I went one more mode in, so I'm like four modes in, I can just type in end, E-N-D, and that takes me all the way back out to privilege mode. You can also hit control Z on your keyboard, that'll do the same thing. So remember, global mode, um, I, I use enable to go to privilege mode, and then I use config T to go to uh, global mode, then I can go to sub interface mode by typing in interface FA01 or FA00. And then I, I can type in exit, and that'll take me back out to global mode. Then I can type in exit again, that'll take me back out to privilege mode. So exit takes you back one level at a time. And takes you all the way back to privilege mode no matter how far you're in. Control Z is just the same thing as typing in the um, end word, the word end. All right, so each Cisco command is based on a keyword and an argument. So if I do show IP protocols, that's the, you know, show is the keyword, what, what I want, what I want to do. Um, and then uh, IP protocols is the argument, what I want you to show me. Ooh, and I take that back. So it's either a keyword or an argument. So what they're saying is show is actually the command, um, and then the keyword like show me what, uh, show me show run, show me the running configuration, and then argument um, is a value like the the IP address. So ping this number, and so the number is the uh, the argument. Now you'll never need that to know that. That's just kind of like you know textbook stuff that we teach in classes. Um, that doesn't really help. Like nowhere on the test will say, hey, here's this command. Which part is the argument? So you won't don't, don't worry about that too much. All right, so when you see syntax, you know, a bold face text indicates the commands, italics indicates arguments, things like that. Uh, moving on. So the context help or context sensitive help. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let me bring back up Packet Tracer. All right, so I turn my router back on. Again, um, it always starts me out in user mode. Then I type in enable, takes me out to privilege mode. Then I type in config T, takes me to global mode. Now, from global mode, you can get context sensitive menu, which means if I type in a question mark, it'll tell me like what's next. So if I do clock, so clock space question mark, I can do clock space time zone. So it's telling me like what the word is next. So if I do clock with a space and then question mark, it'll tell me what I can, what argument, what I can type in next. But if I do CL question mark, it'll tell me what commands I can do from this mode that start with CL. So I can do class map or I can do clock. So that's what they're talking about when they say context sensitive help um, is the question mark. And 
Obviously, when you take the CCNA and you're in the simulators, uh, the question mark does not work. So make sure you don't rely on that. There's also a really cool um, key called the tab key, and tab will finish words for you. So if I do CLO tab, it does clock. Now, if I just did CL, tab wouldn't work because there's two commands that could go with clock, but there's only one command that starts with CLO. So when you're typing some words, like there's a, a logging synchronous command for a line. Let me show you that. So if I do line console zero and then do logging s it'll do the word synchronous for you because there's only one command after logging that starts with s and it's synchronous so that will help immensely all right so that's the context sensitive help all right Next, uh, the syntax checker. Like so, actually, when you put in a bad command, um, it'll it'll put a caret like where the issue is, and it'll tell you like incomplete command or command understood, something like that. And then you can shorten certain things. Like interface can be shortened with int. Configure can be shortened with conf. Um, enable can be shortened with with en. You get the idea. All right, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, keyboard shortcuts. So the up and down arrows will repeat commands that you typed in. So like if I did a show command, then I went change something, then I wanted to run the show command again, I could just do up arrow and it would, it would play that command again. So the history, so the router remembers the last 10 commands entered in. So you can scroll up and scroll down through there. And you can actually change that and say, you know, remember the last 50 commands typed in. And that way you can, why you do that, I have no idea, but you could. And then again, tab is my favorite, completes the remainder of the, the command for you. Control A moves you to the beginning of the line. Control E moves you to the end of the line. Control R redisplays the line. Control Z exits, returns you to privilege mode. They're saying it returns you to user exec mode. That is not correct. At least not in my world. So now that I'm here and I'm in line, so I'm in a sub, inter, uh, a sub mode. Let me hit enter here. Now if I do Control Z, you can see it takes me out to privilege mode. So Cisco slides here is wrong. It says user exec. So control Z does not take you to user mode. It takes you to privilege mode. Freaking Slack and Cisco. All right, if you fat finger a command and you type in the wrong thing, sometimes the router has no idea what you want to do. Instead of giving you an error, it says, hey, you must be look, trying to do a DNS, or a, a, yeah, DNS search. And it'll lock up and it'll say translating um, and it puts in some IP address or whatever. Uh, and it actually goes out and tries to look for whatever you're trying to type in. And it locks up the router for like 30 seconds. You can hit control shift six to get out of that. Or when you first start your router and you go to global mode, type in no IP domain lookup and that will disable that as well. And again, we'll talk about all the router commands again in the in the, the first part of phase two. So don't worry too much about that. All right, there's a packet tracer about navigating the iOS. There's a packet tracer about establishing a console session and basic configuration. So, well, we should always name our routers. Most of the time when you're out in the field, you're not gonna be physically at the router. So it helps to know what router you're, you're, in, you're into because sometimes you'll telnet into one router, you'll make some change, and then from that router you'll telnet into another router and make a change, um, and sometimes you may even telnet into a third. So it helps to know what device you're into. And a good rule of thumb is typically the model number of the router and the location. So if it's in a different city, like let's say Pittsburgh, you know, you could do... Uh, uh, 2811-Pittsburgh if it's in the Pittsburgh office or if it's on the third floor, you know, 1921-Third uh, Floor or Floor 3, whatever you want to do. So always name them with purposes. And we do that with the host name command. So from global mode, remember, every anytime you want to change something on the router, you have to at least be in global mode, the third mode in. So from global mode, I can just do config T, and then I just type in host name space Bob, or whatever you want to call it, and then that would change the prompt to Bob. And I can show you here. So config T, host name Bob. Oh, it's got to spell that right. And then you can see my prompt changes to Bob. So it helps because then when you're typing in command, you know, oh, I'm at the Pittsburgh router or I'm in the New York router or, you know what I mean? So that really kind of helps you to figure out like where you're at. All right. Then they talk about passwords. I'm not going to hammer this too much. Um, this is actually on my note sheet, but you can put a ton of security on the router. 
Uh, and sadly, I gotta go through this. So if I go here and I go to uh, line console zero, and then I do password Cisco, which you should never do, because Cisco is not a strong password, and everybody's going to guess that. And then, so that creates a password, but then to turn it on, I gotta type login. So now if I exit, and I can control Z to go all the way back to privilege mode, I can do show run, which shows me the configuration that's in RAM, the regular memory. And if I do that, and I go to the bottom here, you can see the password shows up in my list. We, we don't want that. We, don't, we never want our password showing in clear text. So what they're saying is, we can put all kinds, of, and that password there is for when I connect through the console port. So, you know, I plug my light blue cable in there, my rollover cable um, from my laptop, and I'm going to type in commands. That's where that password will come into play. So what Cisco wants me to do is to lock all different ways to come in. So then I go back to global mode, and I can do line aux zero. Same thing, password, and you have a strong password here, not Cisco. Log in to turn it on. And I can exit and then I can do line VTY zero space four. Now it's VTY because it used to be called virtual terminal. And then we need to do all five lines. So password Cisco login. So now if somebody connects to the auxiliary port, the console port, or the, the telnet in, uh, they're going to be asked a password. All right, so that's the first part. But then what, what happens like if they, they get past that somehow? And they're, they're going to start in user mode, and then they want to get into glo or, uh, privilege mode to get to global mode. So we can fix that too. We can do enable. Oh, I'm sorry, i got to get out of there. All right, so now I went back to, to the third mode, global mode. And I can do enable secret Cisco. And now that I did this, if I exit all the way out and go back from user mode and hit enter, it's going to ask me for a password. And then if I do enable, it's going to ask me for another password. So that's where those passwords come in from. But if I do a show run, all my passwords are still here in clear text, except for the enable secret. So when I typed in Cisco for enable secret, you can see it kind of it hashes that all out. So that one's encrypted, but the other ones are not. So to fix that, now control C, like here you can see there's more. If I hit enter, I get one more line. And if I hit space bar, it gives me a whole page, whatever's next. So, but in this case, it's done. So now I'm gonna go back to global mode. And from global mode, I can type in service password dash encryption. So serve pass tab to finish it for me. Boom. Now if I control Z and do a show run and go all the way to the bottom, you can see the, the, the word Cisco is now uh, covered. It's now hashed. So it's now I have no more passwords that are in clear text. So going back to my notes, so we can we can do lines with password whatever and then log in. We can uh, get access to privilege mode by typing enable secret and then whatever password you want, like in my case, I took Bob from global mode. And we can encrypt all passwords with service password encryption from global mode. All right, then the next slide, they kind of show you the exact same thing. So line console zero, password and login. So remember, password, and when you put the password in, it doesn't turn it on. Login turns it on, makes it required. Now, a switch has more um, lines than you could telnet in. So 16 people can all telnet into the same switch at the same time. So in that case, you need to do line VTY zero space 15. But on a router, there's typically only, only allows five connections by default. Now, unless you get a different, like a higher end router, it's gonna have a lot more connections. So line VTY zero space, whatever, one less than how many tel or telnet sessions are allowed. So router zero space four, switch zero space 15. All right, and then to secure privilege exec, member enable secret, um, then whatever the password is, in this case, they use class, and exit. Uh, and you can use disable to go back to user mode, and then enable to go back to privilege mode, and then you can see it's asking for a password. 
to secure user mode, I do line console zero, password Cisco, login, exit, and I'm all set. To secure remote access, line VTY zero space four, or zero space 15 if I'm on a switch, and then password Cisco, login. So here's like a little graph. So in user mode, you know, I can do ping, I can do a few show commands, um, or I can type in enable, and then that takes me to privilege mode. And from privilege mode, I can do all my debug commands, I can do all my show commands, I can also do all my copying or manipulation of the uh, configuration files. And then from global command, I can set global variables like the, the host name, the, you know, service password encryption, I can turn on routing protocols, but then I can go into sub interface mode or sub router mode or sub line mode. So there's four or five lines in that you can go. Or I'm sorry, four or five modes in that you can go. All right, so then they talk about um, the startup config and running config. So when you first start a router, it, it loads the operating system from flash. So the router has a flash card, and that's where the iOS is stored. And then that loads the, the operating system, and then the operating system goes to NVRAM, non-volatile RAM, and it looks for a configuration file. If it finds one, it makes a copy of that, and it puts that copy into the regular memory or the RAM, and then that one's called the running config. So when you make changes to a router, you're actually making changes to the running config. And when you power down the router and bring it back up, it loses that. So you have to copy your running config to your startup config um, when you're done so that your changes are saved. The startup config is stored in NVRAM and it's non-volatile, meaning when it loses power, it doesn't lose information. So kind of think about that as a, um, let's say a, like a flash card or, or a flash drive or a hard drive. You turn your PC off, you don't lose what's ever on your hard drive. And then running config is the configuration that's stored um, in memory. So when I turn the PC off or I turn the router off, I lose that information. So you have to copy um, the running configuration to the startup config after you make changes. So when you're all done, everything's working, you want to do a copy run start. So you can abbreviate the running dash config, which is the word run, and you can abbreviate startup dash config with the word start. So I can do copy run start, and the copy command is always copy from to. So copy from where to where. So I can copy run start and that would save my configuration. And then we already talked about service level password. All right, there's also this banner message of the day. And if, this is so that if somebody accesses your router, the very first thing they're gonna see is this message. And it, it'll probably say like authorized access only, um, stuff like that. Now different people have different um, theories on what this should be. Some people say it, it should have the name of the company or should say like if you need access to this router, um, please contact the administrator at this phone number. Some people say make sure you don't put any names in there because then it gives the bad people names. Some people say don't put the, the company in there because then they know exactly what company they're hacking, that kind of stuff. You know, if somebody's just doing a port scan or something or just go, blindly goes it gets into your router, the chances of that are, are so slim that, I mean... Usually, if they're coming into your router, they're targeting you for a reason, um, and they know who they're getting into. So it, it all depends on what the company policy is. But the way you do this is from global mode, you type in banner space MOTD, and that stands for message of the day, and then some kind of delimiting character, the message, and then the delimiting character again. So there you go. So banner MOTD. Now, in this case, I used hashtag, and then the message, and then the hashtag. Now, your delimiting character, in my case hashtag, does, cannot be in your message, otherwise it'll cut your message off as soon as it hits that. So if my message of the day was um, call this um, number at, and if I use the number sign, it, that's where it would stop. It would say call this number, and then it would stop. So whatever, you can use any character for the delimiting character, but make sure that that character is not in your message. Otherwise it cuts your message off when it hits the second. So... First delimiting character says, hey, I'm now I'm going to start the, everything after this is going to be the message. And then as soon as I hit that delimiting character again, that says I'm going to end the message there. And then that will show up. All right. So service password encryption, enable secret the word class, um, password login. So we've already kind of covered all that. All right. Um, devices use a running config uh, and a startup config file. So remember, we just talked about that. Running configurations in RAM. Whenever I'm, whenever I'm, the router is normally running, it's running off the running config. So when I make changes to that, I type in changes. Those changes happen right away. They're live, but they're not saved. In order to save them, I have to move them to the startup configuration file. The startup configuration file is only used 
when you boot the router and a copy of it is made and put into RAM and then that copy is called the running configuration. And that's the only time the running config is used. Um, and that way we don't mess up the config. So your router has um, actually four different types of memory. It has a ROM chip in there that has like the pow the power on self test, the bootstrap that you know how to boot, um, where's the operating system and that kind of stuff, and then that points to the flash. The flash card has the iOS, which is the operating system. You can see all the files on there by typing in show flash. Then we go to NVRAM, which is non-volatile RAM, and that's where the startup configuration is stored. And we can do show startup dash config. So we make a copy of the startup config and we put it into RAM and we call it the running config. I can do show running config or show run. So those are the four memory types on the router and what they're stored in. So um, ROM is the, the post and the bootstrap, flash is the iOS, and VRAM is the startup config, and RAM is the running config. Make sure you know those four locations and those files that are stored there. Uh, ROM, power on self test, bootstrap, flash is the iOS, and VRAM is the startup config, and then regular RAM is the running config. All right, so if you need to soft boot the router, like let's say obviously you're you're dialing into a router that's that's a uh, you know up in New York or something, and you're in Pittsburgh, um, you can just type in reload, and that will actually do a soft boot of the router, uh, and power and power cycle it. But don't forget when you do that, and you power cycle that, um, that's going to remove your running configuration. So unless your configuration is saved, uh, you'll lose it. So a lot of people, by the time they get to phase three and phase four, um, and they're typing in longer commands, um, they'll do a reload and they forgot that they didn't do a, a copy run start. And now all the st their stuff is gone. They're like, oh, oh. I was like, yeah, buddy, sorry. All right. So I can, if, if for some reason, let's say I buy a router off of eBay and for some reason there's some configuration stuff on there, I can delete the startup config file by just going into privilege mode, typing in erase space startup dash config. And that will erase the startup file. Then I do reload, and then it would reload. It would load a blank startup file because there is no startup file, so nothing would be loaded. And then the router would start and say, okay, hey, do you want to go into auto configuration mode? All right, so again, um, you can also, like when you're doing your router, you can actually copy the, the configuration that, that shows, and then you can paste that back into another router or the same router. So if I go to here, and I do a show run, yeah, and I don't fat finger it. I can then copy that show run command, and you can start wherever you want. Let's just do that. And I can right click, copy. I can put it into a text file. You make you want to make sure you use a text document, um, you, like WordPad or, or Notepad. If you use Microsoft Word. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff will be added into the white space that you won't see, uh, and it won't it won't copy correctly. So then I can actually just grab this, and I can go to a new router. So I'll close that router, bring that back up, bring me a new router in, let it boot, and wait, and keep waiting. All right, so no. When you see this, do you want to enter initial configuration or do you want to go into auto configuration? You need to always type in no. That tells you there's no startup file because it's asking you, it's like, hey, I don't have anything. Do you want to put something in there? So you want to type in no. And um, to quote Jeremy, the great CBT nugget god of Cisco, um, you auto not use auto configuration. All right, so then from the router, I can go enable and then global. And then from there, I can just paste it in. Right click, paste, and all my commands go in there. And you can see my router is now named Bob. So now these two routers have the exact same configuration. And then if for some reason I wanted to save that, I just do copy from to. So copy from running configuration to startup configuration. Hit enter, it'll ask you what do you want to name it. You need to accept that default. If you name it anything else, it won't work. Enter, and you're all set. Um, Cisco also has a, a scripting language, TLC, um, that I haven't ever seen like uh, mentioned very much. Um, but there's actually a book on Amazon about TLC scripting for Cisco um, that might help you if you're really into that. 
All right, so again, I can do the, the text file, uh, and I can use it to basically just put on b uh, generic stuff. Just be careful. Like, if you're trying to do an entire configuration, like you've got VLANs configured, you got ACLs, things like that, some some things don't necessarily go over. Um, you know, when you, we create VLANs and we do show run, sometimes those don't get copied over when we do the, the thing from a uh, uh, text file. And just also be careful what you create the text file in, because if you use Microsoft Word or something like that, you get a whole bunch of gobbledygook in the white space that you don't see uh, that's formatting stuff for Word, and then you, all of a sudden your, your paste doesn't work anymore, or your paste never works. All right. So then, again, they're talking about uh, copying switch settings, which we just did. Address scheme. Da, 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 da. So... Obviously, every device on a network has to have an IP address, just like every house in America has to have an IP, has to have a, a house address. So you have an IP address, you have a subnet mask, and they're kind of like the lock and key. An IP address without the subnet mask is almost useless. Um, the subnet mask tells the computer what part of the address is shared on the network and what part is unique to your PC. So every IP address has two parts. The part that's that's shared by everybody on that network, the kind of this the network ID, and then the part that's unique to you. So in this case, um, what's your IP address is 192.168.1.10. So and then we see the subnet mask, 255.255.255. So everything above a 255 is part of the network and everything above the zero is unique to you. So everybody on this network would be 192.168.1 something. But only you can be 10. Nobody else can be 10. Only you. So that's the part of the IP address in the subnet mask. And then the default gateway is, hey, if, if it's not stored on my computer, um, I need to look here. This is where I need to go to to find it. Which typically points to the closest router to you. Because then your router understands like where things are. So an IP address is typically listed in what they call dotted decimal format. And it just means we get, a, we get a number and a dot and a number and a dot and a number and a dot and a number. And each of these numbers is called an octet because it's made up of eight bits. You'd think it'd be called a byte, but it, it's, a made up of, it's called an octet. So first octet, second octet, third octet, fourth octet. And we'll get into a whole bunch of subnet math a little bit later. All right, so on a switch, though, a switch has a whole bunch of different ports. Let me show you a picture of a switch real quick. All right, so here's just a whole bunch of pictures. So here's a, a big switch. Here's a switch, smaller switch. This is 24 ports. So they typically come in multiples of like 8, you know, 8, 16, 24, 48. Um, modular switch. Ooh, you probably can't see that. There you go. Big old modular switch. But this is typically, uh, yeah, so this is kind of like what you see in these 24 port switches. And these ports are physical ports, but they're not NIC cards. And by that, I mean they don't get IP addresses. They're just physical ports that we don't assign IP addresses to switch ports. But if I need to remotely manage a switch and, you know, and get to it by IP address, I can create an IP address on what they call the switch virtual interface. Um, and then I can use that IP address to get into the switch and telnet in and then do commands and things like that. So remember, most of the time in networking, you're not physically at those locations. You know, somebody calls and you remote into a device. And that's why each device needs an IP address to get into it. But a switch doesn't have IP, IP addresses for all 24 or 48 ports. So kind of keep that in mind. And again, when we get into phase two, this will make more sense to you. All right, so manual, if, if, I, if I assign an IP address where I said use the following IP address, we call this a static IP address, and then we type it in ourselves, and that remains there until I remove it. If I type, if I just click on this obtain IP address automatically, it sets the PC up for DHCP. Now, your PC at home is probably set that way. So if I go down to the little computer icon on my bottom right and click, and then do show adapter settings, there's my card, and if I do properties, you can see I'm on DHCP. But you can actually see what your IP address is on by clicking on it, hit status, details. So most of the time, you're 192.168.1.something because all home routers and home devices pass out IP addresses on 192.168.1. So your IP address can be either DHCP, meaning you're, you're going to get the IP address from somewhere else, or you're putting the IP address in manually where it says use the following IP address. And again, that just says use, use DHCP. DHCP is Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, and it's just it's something that runs on a server or a home router um, or from the ISP where they push out an IP address to you. 
All right, remember the switch virtual interface we talked about? So that's what we assign an IP address to a switch. So if I have a 48 port switch, it doesn't need 48 IP addresses. Um, basically, I create a VLAN, uh, and then I assign the IP address to one of the VLANs, and then I just use that to get into. Now, they mentioned here the no shutdown command. All interfaces on Cisco devices are, are disabled by default. So even if you get like a, a wireless access point, the, the wireless radio is turned off by default um, we, with the command shut down. So you have to do no shutdown in order to turn it on. So the word no is, is typically like the opposite of a command. So if I do IP address and put an IP address on, then I do no IP address that removes the IP address. If I do shutdown, it's disabled. If I do no shutdown, it turns it on. All right, then there's a, a lab for basic connectivity. And then, like, from my PC, I can type in ipconfig in the command prompt. So if I go to the start and I type in cmd, um, it'll bring up a command prompt that looks like that. And then from there, I can type in ipconfig, and it'll show me, like, what my IP address is. In this case, 192.168.11.1. Now, on a router or switch, you can do show IP interface brief or show IP INT BR, and it shows you every interface on that device, whether it has an IP address or not, and what its status is. So it's a very useful command, especially like if you're remoting into a device and you have no idea how many interfaces it has or which ones are operational and that kind of stuff. All right, ping. Ping is short for Packet Internet Groper, and what it does, my understanding is what Ping does is it actually takes the alphabet and, and creates a packet based on that, and it sends out four of those um, to the destination and back, hopefully. So if I go back to my uh, command prompt, yeah, and I, you can do an IP address or you can do a name. So if I ping www.google.com, there's one, two, three, four. So it tells you um, how how long it took to get there. So time, 31 milliseconds. So each ping was 31, 31, 32, 31. So you can also use this like from a central location in your network. So you're first taking over a network, you know, your first network job. You can ping from that central location to all these different endpoints and kind of see how much time it takes to get there. Then over the course of uh, six months or something, you make your changes and you, you get the network running better. And then you run pings from that same location. Hopefully your times would be down. Then when it comes review time, you show that to your boss and say, look, I've reduced network speed by 50%. Yay, and now you have concrete proof that you did it. All right, so that's what ping does now. So, so if I get my four replies back, it means I got there and back, which is nice. Now, sometimes when you make configuration changes and you have multiple routers to go through, the first, maybe even the second command will time out. So it'll say request timed out, request timed out. I've seen people after the second request timed out stop ping with a control C and then go into troubleshooting mode. You always want to wait to at least the third packet because sometimes it can take each device a, a couple seconds to figure out where to go. And if I'm, I hit one router, he's going to make a decision, then another router's going to make a decision, then another router's going to make a decision. So sometimes the first two packets can get lost, and then the third and fourth would get would be fine. Then you run ping again, and all four packets would work. So sometimes people will troubleshoot issues that are not there. So ping just stands for Packet Internet Groper, and I can ping by IP address or the DNS friendly name. And I can get to the sites and back. Now, ping uses um, ICMP uh, echo um, request and reply. So if you have that, you typically want that turned off at your border um, so that people can't ping inside of your network. All right, then there's a, a lab for building a simple network. It's kind of generic. And managing switch access. We'll probably do this eventually. And then the summary. Da, 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 da. Hey, tutor me. Great. There's a skills integration, uh, blah. So make sure you understand these commands. So when we talk about in-band and out-of-band, out-of-band means I don't need an IP address to connect to it. Um, you know, the device doesn't need an IP address. Um, I can just plug a cable into it. So if I'm doing a console or an auxiliary port, that's out-of-band management. Um, if, I'm, if it has an IP address and I need to use that, like if I'm using uh, Telnet or SSH, that's in-band configuration or in-band management. All right, if you have any questions on what any of these things do or mean, make sure you let me know in the comments. Um, I'm more than happy to reply back to you and let you know. And that's about it. So yay, Cisco.